<clears throat> okay, today we're talking about thyroid disease, which is a pretty big topic to cover um, in an hour. Are there any elements of thyroid disease that you guys specifically want to talk about? All of it? None of it? We could gossip instead. Um, so what I might aim to do is firstly go through what the effects of thyroid hormones are, so just a bit of thyroid hormone physiology. Um, how thyroid hormones are made is very interesting but very complicated and actually not very relevant for treatment or anything. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into that because I think it would take half an hour and not have um, be applicable to most of you in clinical situations. Is that all right? Yeah, that sounds good. Good. Okay, so tell me what what do thyroid hormones do? Why do we need them? A conductor of the endocrine orchestra. Very good. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So they dictate production rates, rates of production of most of the hormones. Oh, can you guys hear that noise? Okay, few. you. <laughs> and it's the neighbor's ankle grinding out the front. Um, <laughs> so they dictate the rate of endocrine or, or pretty much all of the hormones production, but they also dictate the rate of excretion of a lot of the hormones as well. So they, they can have a lot of effects on other endocrine system functions. Um, what else do they do? Uh, support immunity, support immunity. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not quite sure exactly. You know. What about um, metabolism, carbon oh, metabolism? Speed up, uh, uh, speed up metabolism. Exactly. So they dictate calorie, calor, calorie genesis. So how many calories are going to be consumed for a certain function? Um, and they also dictate the rate of protein synthesis and or they're involved in the, the protein synthesis um, process. What about on the heart? What's their effect on the heart? <clears throat> well, in cats, the excess causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So mm -hmm. uh, they, they cause um, uh, muscle is it hypertrophy? Yes. Or hyperplasia, hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, yeah. Um, so do you know how they do that? I find this really interesting. No. Okay. <laughs> Someone else can have a turn now. Anybody? No. So what they do, what the thyroid hormone does in the heart is increases both the affinity of beta cell of beta receptors and the number of beta receptors on the on each myocardial cell so we get increased sensitivity to catecholamines so therefore the heart beats faster and harder with the same amount of adrenaline secretion so given that the heart's a muscle and it's working harder it's going to Hypertrophy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So muscles that work get bigger. And that includes the heart muscle. Excellent. What about the effect on red cell production? Um, what happens in hypothyroid dogs? They get a um, regenerative anemia. Yep. So any guesses as to what thyroid hormone or how thyroid hormone interacts with red blood cells? How? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with EPO. Yes, it does. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah, so thyroid hormone is essential in the production of EPO and therefore generation of red cells. Wow. So if you've got deficiency 
less EPO, less red blood cells. Good. So you covered most of them. The only other one um, is fetal development, which we just don't see very often, but it's very important in breeding animals uh, and humans. They test thyroid hormone levels um, in pregnant women because there's, there can be complications if their thyroid hormones are out. I think hypothyroid bitches don't come on heat. Uh, oh, interesting. I don't, well, I don't think. Yeah, correct me really if I'm wrong. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. But certainly they have interactions with the other endocrine system, so that would make sense, wouldn't it? Other mm. endocrine, endocrine functions, I should say. Um, good. So they're the main kind of functions of the thyroid hormones and then we can use that understanding to sort of then predict what we're going to see with hyperthyroidism hypothyroidism do you have a preference which one you want to talk about first no, start at the bottom and work out <laughs> okay i like that theory all the textbooks have hypo first as well so that makes sense um okay what causes hypothyroidism in dogs what's the syndrome mm -hmm. It's immune-mediated thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. Good. Vast majority of the time, it's exactly right. So autoimmune disease where um, uh, there's anti-thyroid antibodies and we get infiltration of lymph lymphocytes and plasma cells to lymphoplasmacytic inflammation. What happens after severe, profound inflammation? Probably scarring. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> so we get fibrosis. So if we think about the phases of that disease, we have an inflammatory phase where there's actually still a fair bit of thyroid tissue and the dogs usually aren't hypothyroid yet. When we see hypothyroidism, we've got replacement of functional thyroid tissue with fibrosis. So the thyroid is actually atrophied in most cases. Make sense? Yes. Yep. So there's in the um, Nelson and Feldman uh, endocrinology textbook, there's a good sort of um, breakdown of the four stages of hypothyroidism. And the first two stages are subclinical. So we don't see any clinical signs. And you have to have lost 60, no, you have to have lost 90% of your thyroid before we have detectable low T4 or clinical signs associated with hypothyroidism. And the reason I want to mention this is because we the testing for hypothyroidism has become a little bit complicated of late. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's developed through a whole lot of stages. Mm. Like there was a T three um, suppression, mm. I think. Yep. <clears throat> but T three was very hard to get when I was in mm. England. Uh, bet I worked with it. The Goddard Group actually imported it from the states. Yeah. So we were one of the few that had it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was regarded as the gold standard way back. Yeah. Um, and then we were able to do um, uh, free T4 was the next stage. Mm -hmm. And now we can do TSH. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you know about the different methodologies for testing free T4? No. No? Um, so there's three different assays that are kind of done variably by different labs. The one that's most sensitive is the one by equilibrium dialysis, testing by equilibrium dialysis. Um, they've discontinued that. We don't have it available in Australia currently. Is that right? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. I knew last time I was looking for it, it was heaps more expensive than yeah. um, without using ED. Yeah. I can't remember what I chose to do. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tricky because the free T4, looking at the stats, free T4 by by equilibrium dialysis is the best test. It's got the highest sensitivity and specificity for hypothyroidism. But when you then, you can't sort of translate those stats to the other methodologies. So technically sort of free T4 is the way to diagnose it, but actually when you're using chemiluminescence is the other one that's most commonly used. Um, it has the same complications or kind of interferences as a total T4 does. So yeah. sometimes we can get false false positives and negatives, so poor sensitivity and specificity. 
No, not poor. It's still better than total people, but we have to look much more at the big picture now. The diagnosis is very much a combination of clinical, biochemical, and um, thyroid hormone testing. Are you more likely now to use the TSH test than then you would have been having ED three T four? Yeah, um, yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I actually. I'm so sick of saying to people, let's do this test and then it, we, it might be conclusive and it might not be conclusive and then you'll have to come back and have another test and blah, blah, blah. So I just say to people, oh, it's really hard to diagnose. We're going to have to do all the tests at once. It's going to be $600. And so I think it manages people's expectations a little bit better and it allows me to get that big picture. So if we... So if you were testing a dog in the inflammatory stage so the first two subclinical stages where there's just inflammation total t4 is probably going to be normal what's your tsh going to be um, it might be coming up a bit yeah <coughs> exactly <coughs> so you're starting to get progressive loss of thyroid tissue so you need more stimulation to produce the same amount of t4 but there's functional reserve there. So you've still got a normal total T4, but your TSH is going to go up. Then when you start to get to stage three, which is where we start to get clinical signs and really is the only time we should be checking for thyroid disease, if there's clinical signs of thyroid disease. Um, and what's happening, what should be happening with the total T4 at this stage? Stage three, we've got fibrosis, we've got functional loss. T4 would be dropping. Exactly. Yep. What's happening with the TSH? Should be going way up. Yep. Good. Um, what about when the thyroid hormone, the thyroid gland is completely atrophic and fibros fibrotic and there's very little T4 in circulation? What's the TSH going to be doing? Should be way high, I would have thought. Should be way high, but the pituitary runs out of TSH. So when it's work, been working overtime for years, because this progresses so slowly, the TSH gets to a point where it's really, really high and then it turns a corner and starts to come down again. And then we're going to see it in normal range when these dogs have quite progressed clinically if you were doing thyroid biopsies, but by our perspective, they only started showing clinical signs a year ago. So the TSH is going to come down into normal and then it's going to actually be low in some patients. So it's quite variable and less specific, less sensitive, less accurate. Let's go with that so I don't have to get my head around. <laughs> um, uh, in patients with stage four hypothyroidism. So whilst the TSH is, is a really good test if you're trying to detect an early kind of subtle hypothyroidism, it's not very good in those like really sort of um, affected progressed cases. Um, what are some other causes of hypothyroidism other than the, the most common one? Yeah. Any illness? Oh, do you mean, oh, right, actual hypothyroidism, yeah. Actual hypothyroidism. Actual hypothyroidism. Yeah. That, count, that, that counts, Ron. That is hypothyroidism illness. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is a final warning. Oh, sorry, I'm at the airport. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, what, what was that, that one? I didn't catch it. Um, Bron said um, illness causing hypothyroidism. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I think about hypothyroidism, I think about primary. Have we got thyroid hormone, thyroid gland disease, secondary pituitary gland disease, or tertiary, which is hypothalamic disease? So TRH comes from the hypothalamus, TSH from the pituitary, and then obviously T4, T3 from the thyroid gland. So primary, secondary, tertiary. So if we look at illness as an example, that causes TSH suppression. So that's a cause of secondary hypothyroidism, but it is still hypothyroidism. Yeah, the so-called sick thyroid syndrome. Yes, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Neoplasia. Good, <clears throat> yeah. Aware. 
Potentially any of those levels, I think. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Any others? We talked a little bit about it in the last session. One of the um, skip, trying to give you hints. Oh, it was growth hormone last session, so. It was. What's the most common cause of growth hormone deficiency? Um, is that a, um, uh, an adrenal adrenal tumor in cats? Um, oh, no. No. Um, we were talking about the German shepherds with the... Um, Pituitary dwarfism. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what other hormones might be impacted other than growth hormone if you had pituitary dwarfism? Oh, uh, right, yeah. So cretinism. Right. Yes, exactly. So congenital hypothyroidism, where they're just born without the capacity to secrete TSH. Good. Any others? What about iatrogenic? When might we have to supplement T4 because we caused hypothyroidism? In part after radio iodine right. yeah, or over um, supplementation, over treatment with oral antithyroid drugs. Yeah, usually um, quite rapidly reversible, the um, oral overdose, um, but certainly radioactive iodine is the most common cause of iatrogenic hypothyroidism. What about if my cat had um, a hypophysectomy because it had um, acromegaly? Oh, yes. Well, that's... <clears throat> if you took yeah. out the pituitary gland, <clears throat> you're going to need to supplement the hormones. Yeah, they have to be supplemented with um, three hormones, thyroid, um, adrenal and uh, insulin, I think. Do they need insulin? Right. Okay. Oh, no, the diabetes self-corrects. Yes. That's yeah. right. Um, but what is the other hormone? I um, thought it was three. Yeah, I Apple. think you're right, but I can't remember. We'll come back to that when we get to that hormone in the endocrine system. <laughs> Um, good so we covered the causes of hypothyroidism and I think it's nice to just have that kind of um, primary secondary tertiary picture in your head because if you get a young dog with dwarfism or some weird growth thing or the growth plates haven't closed that's um, one of the markers of congenital hypothyroidism um, then it's just nice to have on your list you can do your TSH, T4, 3T4 thyroid panel ADH, ADH, good work, Alison. The other hormone is ADH. She's just put that on the chat. Thank you. <laughs> She's driving. She can't, uh, can't talk. Um, is there, um, can you get partial um, uh, congenital, like is it either all or nothing with um, hypothyroidism congenital? Um, such a good question. Um, there's quite a few different forms of congenital hypothyroidism. So there's a couple of breeds that are reported to have an abnormality in like the transporter that allows iodine into the thyroid and that will be a primary. Um, and then obviously the um, like German shepherds with pituitary dwarfism will be a secondary. Um, the others, and it depends how bad, like if, if say the receptor is partially dysfunctional, you might have some. T4, so it could be a spectrum for sure. So I was always imagining it would be a super obvious um, presentation, but if you're just talking about looking for failure to, failure to close growth, to growth. Place, you might yeah. be a more subtle presentation. Yeah. I once had a schnauzer who presented for dullness at seven years of age, progressive dullness over the previous sort of two years, but normal puppy by all reports. It was about this big, it's hard to tell online, but maybe like 15, 20 centimetres in length. 
and maybe like 20 centimeters in height. It was this tiny little square thing. And we x-rayed it and none of its growth plates were closed. And it had hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism. Um, what else? It was deficient in so many, it, like every hormone we tested it felt like. Um, so that was an interesting one. And it's growth plate, we started supplementing thyroid hormone, it's growth plate's never closed, I don't know. We never really got to the bottom of it. it. Needed like genetic receptor testing and stuff of its parathyroids and thyroids. Um, okay, so we've done causes, we've done the different stages of hypothyroidism and we've kind of done diagnosis. Do we want to go more into diagnosis? If there's anything more to learn from it, yes, but... Yeah, so well, let's go back to, because we said the diagnosis has to be based on the clinical bio biochemical picture and hematology picture, I should say. What are we looking for? What does the picture look like? High cholesterol, mm -hmm. non-regenerative anemia. Do you know what percentage um, have high cholesterol? It's about 75%. I think. <gasps> yeah, well done. How did you know? <laughs> There are certain parts of the brain that are actually still working. <laughs> that was great. Well done. 75%. So uh, I actually would have like instinctively thought higher than that. So I would expect hypercholesterolemia in the vast majority of my hypothyroid dogs, but it's not the case. Good. Hypercholesterol. Um, what was the other one you said? Anemia, maybe like 50 or 60% for the guess. Yep. Cholesterol, yep. Anything else? I've got a feeling liver enzymes somehow, but I just can't remember. I don't have liver enzymes on my list. No, um, I might be wrong. What about the muscles? Oh, what about the muscles? Sixty, you know that. Um, okay, let's go back to clinical science. We jump straight to um, biochem and hematology. What do you see? What do the clients complain about with hypothyroid dogs? Listlessness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sensitivity to cold weather. Mm -hmm. um, uh, hair coat changes. Uh, Good, yeah. Symmetrical non prioritic alopecia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like if you clip them, the hair doesn't grow back. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Weight gain. Yes, good. Obesity is a big one. Um, when we talked about the alopecia, tell me more about the other dermatologic manifestations. Uh, the skin's thickened. Um, good. Why? <laughs> I was scared you'd ask that. <laughs> Do you know? No. No. Um, have you heard of myxedema? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really know what the mechanism is, but there's increased fluid and there's increased mucin in the skin. Um, so a lot of these patients, most people have been in a clinical situation where they're looking at a dog and going, the hormones aren't right but it could be Cushing's, could be thyroid. They've got quite similar presentation as far as alopecia and stuff goes. Um, the skin is one of my favourite tests to do. So what will Cushing's dog's skin look like? Oh, it's thinner. Thin, exactly. <clears throat> Hypothyroid is a thick skin disease. Cushing's is a thin skin disease. So it's one of my big sort of physical exam. I'm pinching lips, the, the scruff, and you can sometimes feel that it's quite thickened um good what about these dogs the owner comes in and says oh just they just used to be able to jump into the car and now they can't is that something any of you have heard no but no? it makes sense i guess yeah so these dogs get a myopathy 
um, and I used to know the mechanism of it. Yeah. And they can get um, megrosophagus yes, as a result. Exactly. Yeah. Myopathy and a new and lots of neuropathies actually. So megrosophagus is one of them. Have you ever seen any uh, any hypothyroid dogs with any cranial neuropathies? Uh, trigeminal, I think it is. I don't know. Trigeminal is hard to detect because it's sensory. Facial. Good on sensory. Facial. We see facial. Facial nerve. Yes. Good. Yeah. So facial nerve palsies are often associated with hypothyroidism. In fact, focal cranial neuropathies are often associated with hypothyroidism. So cranial nerve seven, where their face drops, and sometimes it's accompanied by trigeminal. But what we usually see is the facial nerve palsy because they can't blink and their face drops and it's kind of visible, whereas trigeminal could be happening, but it's often, if it's unilateral, there'll be no clinical signs. What happens when you've got a bilateral trigeminal palsy? Their mouth drops open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They become like Mr. Ed. You can get their lower jaw and go, wah, 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 wah. There's no... Uh... <laughs> I want to <laughs> <hurt you. laughs> Exactly. So they get drop jaw. So that's that's something you can see. But most of the time, these hypothyroidism-associated cranial neuropathies are unilateral, um, sometimes bilateral, but mostly unilateral. Um, what other cranial nerve might we see affected? Yeah, the eight. Good, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> vestibular. So we see vestibular disease with increasing increased frequency in dogs with hypothyroidism. Um, so going back to the not being able to jump in the car and the myopathy, around between 60 and 70% of these dogs have an elevated CK, which is quite a high number. So when you can't rely 100% on your cholesterol, having the CK in your profile is really nice. So if you're suspicious, make sure that you're doing a profile with CK in it because it's going to add to your clinical evidence in case the um, thyroid hormone testing is inconclusive. Make sense? Mm. <clears throat> what about their hearts? What are their hearts doing? Well, uh, the opposite of the hypertrophic, wouldn't it be uh, dilative and perhaps mm -hmm. weaker? Yep. I think they get bradycardia. Good. Yeah. It's very rare to see a heart rate over 100 in a severe, severely hypothyroid dog. I once had a dog in an Addisonian crisis who was also having a um like severely hypothyroid and i was listening to his heart and thinking he's like this because his potassium's through the roof and then i fixed his potassium and his heart rate was still like 60 i was like ooh, <laughs> and there was there was hypothyroid concurrently um so their heart rate's often low um they often have dcm on ultrasound and interestingly, Dobermans are one of the breeds predisposed to both DCM and hypothyroidism. And you do an echo on them and you diagnose DCM. If they have concurrent hypothyroidism, the DCM prognosis is so much better. If you correct the thyroid hormone, it corrects the um, DCM correct. So um, that's just one breed that it's worth looking into um, the thyroid level if you're diagnosing heart disease. Um, the other thing that um, hypothyroidism can do is actually cause a spontaneous atrial fibrillation. Um, and I've had a rotwheeler that I managed with Rita who had atrial fibrillation and was um, reversed and completely resolved with thyroid hormone supplementation, which is pretty cool. Mm. Mm. What about ocular effects? I think you can get some uh, lipid corneal dystrophy. Mm -hmm. I don't know Good. about others. <laughs> yeah, it's all about lipid. So corneal de deposits of lipid and then anterior chamber can get a lipid effusion in it. 
um, so you can get clouding of the fluid in there. That's for the extent of my knowledge of eyes. Okay. Would you, I guess secondarily with the facial paralysis, I've had them present with a corneal ulcer and a dry eye, and then mm. it was facial paralysis, and then we worked out it was hypothyroid. Interesting. So was that a cranial nerve palsy? Like was that, because um, you know how the tear film, the um, corneal dryness is a sensory nerve signal to produce tears? Yeah, I think it was partly a lack of tears from the facial nerve innervation of the lacrimal gland and also it wasn't blinking and it wasn't blinking, it had no uh, cut people. Yes. Yeah, right. And so it had facial palsy. Yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. And a little cavalier key child. Yeah. And she had a dermatopathy as well. And yeah, oh. you know, and the owners put her down. Oh, she's just getting old, so she's lazy and getting fat. But yeah, she's type of sorry. Yeah, right. Good good diagnosis. Um, okay, so we've covered, there are all the clinical signs I had on my list. We've covered all the biochemical and hematologic things I had on my list. The only other thing, the platelet count tends to be high, but the range that we sort of expect in platelet counts is so wide. It's just maybe another thing to just keep an eye out for on your hematol, but I certainly wouldn't. Dogs with Cushing's also have high platelet count, so it's not going to help you differentiate. Um, okay, so what are you guys, if you're suspicious of hypothyroidism, what would you do? I've already told you what I'd do, so now you're all going to just say that. What's your first test, typically, that you'd do? Oh, yeah, well, I'd go T4 and um, TSH. Yeah, total T4? Uh, well, ideally free. Uh, <clears throat> okay. But, Do everything. Because <clears throat> total T4 is totally unreliable. Yeah. It's pretty hard. What about if the total T4 was normal? Yeah, that wouldn't rule it out. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Um, no, you got me there. Um, I have got a stat on this. It is... Low total T4. Um, so depending on the study that you look at, some studies say 100% of dogs have low total T4s. And then the there's other studies that like the absolute lowest is 89% have low total T4s. So there may be 11% that have normal total T4s. I think that probably depends on the reference ranges that the lab's using. Um, but yeah, vast majority. And also how they're gold, doing their gold standard. Um, it is hypothyroidism. Like if they're really severely affected dogs, then they're more likely to have a low total T4. Um, so total T4 is a good screening test in that if it's low, worth looking into, if there's clinical signs supportive, but it's not a very good diagnostic test because there's lots of other reasons it might be low. Um, okay, how are we going to treat it? A thyroid supplement. Yeah. When are we going to test whether we're treating a pro uh, with enough supplement? What is it too? Is it? David Judge said not to test at all. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's really? clinical sign. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not a bad port, actually, because there's a fair bit of fluctuation over the course of a day on um, thyroid hormone level after dosing. I think uh, it's... Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, two hours later, two hours after dosing. It's, it? Yeah, so you, you're looking for a peak. Um, so you don't want them to be hyperthyroidism, but we might sort of let them be a little bit low at certain times of the day. Um, so four to six hours after the pill is the ideal dosing time, um, testing time. Four to six. Four to six, yeah. Um, okay. But like Bron said, I, there's, if they're still clinical, we're probably going to up it. If they're, well, how long does it take for the clinical signs to resolve? Like how long would you expect them to have a normal hair coat? Uh, many, many months. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and what about? 
heart rate, can you depend on that as a sign, as a clinical sign? It, it would be a sign that would be very fluctuant. There's so many other things yeah. can affect it. So many variables, yeah. So obviously if it's 70 and the dog looks anxious, you sort of think, okay, I'm probably underdoing it, but it's it's not going to be a very sensitive test for how well you're doing. Um, mm. Probably the blood tests would be a good marker, but we don't want to be doing full blood panels every month. Um, yeah, I'm sort of with Bron and Dave Church. But technically, we should be testing four to six hours afterwards and seeing if we've got the, we want the thyroid hormone in the kind of low end of the normal range. Well, actually, um, with heart rates, another interesting thing I noticed was when I was in Wagga, mostly the heart rates when they came into the consulting room were, were quite low, around the 100 mark or mm -hmm. lower, whereas you get the city dogs that are, anxious and interesting handled differently uh, yeah. by their owners they're you know 144 is not unusual yeah completely um is there a um size difference do you see more large breed dogs oh, in well the country dogs are more likely to be working breeds um yeah. so yes they're bigger um mm. <clears throat> and, and also uh, bigger dogs tend to be less anxious dogs don't they tend, maybe yeah and their owners are less anxious too so that makes a very really big difference yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right, should we talk about hyperthyroidism? What causes it? Well, it's usually a benign pituitary, uh, thyroid tumour. Yes, thyroid tumour or... Adenoma, adenomatous. Enlargement that's functional? Uh, yes, I would say hyperplasia. Okay. Um, but that's a really good point. And I have to say, I didn't see it in my notes. Because um, it's often, it can be asymmetrical, but if it's asymmetrical, I am worried about a tumour in which, so 10% of the time it's a tumour. And... 90% of the time I would have said hyperplasia. So if you feel asymmetry, then it's worth looking for the, the minority that are carcinomas. Um, yes, so I might just park that. When, when I say what causes it, I meant what factors contribute to the development of it. Do we know? Does any, has anybody? <laughs> Dive we talk the about diet. Yeah, we talk about diet because we see hyperthyroidism in it's quite regional. So some parts of the world don't see it, and some parts of the same country don't see it, but you see it a lot in others. And I think after the commercial diet came out, whenever mm -hmm. what year that was, we saw an increase in hyperthyroidism. So they're thinking the iodine content, I think, or some contaminants, plastics or something in the diet. I don't know. Yeah. Too much iodine. Isn't, yeah. there some, isn't there some connection to canned food? Mm. Like, yeah. um, not, maybe not proven, but suspected. Proven, yeah. So two to three times odds ratio of developing hypothyroidism if fed can die. Okay. So definitely demonstrated. But the reason the like, cause isn't known. Why? Why, did you say? Yeah. Well, see, this is where I turn into, uh, into a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Uh, it something to do with the actual food or the actual lining of the can. Yeah, EPA or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of theories and causality, cause, cause, causality is very hard to establish. Like it's hard to say it's this component of the can that is causing this. It's, and there's so many other environmental, like cats fed canned diets might also have urinary tract disease more likely. You know, there's so many different factors um, that might contribute to to cats being on a canned diet but there's more and more data coming out on um bpa you know bpa has recently been banned in human foods because of its endocrine disruptor um disrupting effects 
Um, so uh, there's molecules in, oh, <laughs> how do, do we want to go here? I'm really showing my true colors as a hippie. Um, <laughs> so the a lot of the plastics lining cans, BPA, have now been associated with endocrine disruption. So the molecules that end up in the food mimic thyroid hormone. They look the same as thyroid hormone. And they are detected at the level of the thyroid and the thyroid says, oh, I don't need positive negative feedback. I don't need to secrete any more thyroid hormone. Um, these molecules accumulate in tissue, so in fat tissue and things. So we're all we've all got, you know, there's studies where they've biopsied um fat tissue from humans. And even people who live really, really clean have a lot of these molecules just in their fat. Um, and we've seen increased incidence of thyroid diseases in both humans and cats since the 70s, since these molecules were became part of normal life kind of thing. Um, now it's in, <clears throat> it's in the water, it's in the food chain, they're everywhere, they're unavoidable, sorry. <clears throat> um, and as I said, the people that live super clean and people who it's not on their radar and they don't care uh, have pretty equivalent amounts of these in their tissues. No. Oh no, I'm just saying that's not fair. No, I no, exactly. It. Yeah, exactly. But it's it's every they're absolutely everywhere. Um so there there's a, been quite a few studies looking at cats because cats live quite closely with soft furnishings as well. Um and there's a fire retardant called polybrominated diphenyl PBD E, diphenyl something. Um, which was used between the 70s and has only just been discontinued in the sort of mid-2000s, 2010-ish in different countries. And that has also been associated with endocrine disruption and thyroid disease. And that's the one that they think cats, because they live so closely with dust and soft furnishings, they get right in, they put their nose in there and they breathe it all the time and they just sleep most of the day. Um, cats have very high levels of that. And the use of that happen at the same time as the incidence of thyroid hormone disease crept up in cats. Um, so there's these goitrogens that are recognised in both human and animal health are potentially factors in the development of hypothyroidism, but there's others as well, um, which Alison alluded to with a potential mild iodine deficiency in diets. Um, what, why is iodine, why will iodine impact thyroid hormone levels? What's an essential molecule in thyroid hormone? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. So if you've got, if you're eating a deficient diet, what will happen to your thyroid hormone levels? they probably go down. Yeah, good. Which is exactly the science that they're using, you know, the new thyroid diets. It's not really new anymore, but the really profoundly iodine deficient diets that they actually use as treatment for hypothyroidism. Um, so thyroid hormone level goes down if you're not eating enough iodine. Um, so say you've been on a chronically iodine deficient diet and your thyroid has made all of these new receptors for iodine to try and increase, you know, if one little iodine comes past, we're going to grab it. Um, and then all of a sudden you switch diets to an iodine sufficient diet. What's going to happen? Yeah, you can see hypothyroidism happening Ooh, there, I think. Exactly, yeah. So you get actually thyroid toxicosis in some patients and their dietary iodine level is normal. It's just that they've got more capacity to absorb it at the level of their thyroid. Um, so we can have nutritional hypothyroidism through that mechanism. Um, that can be geographical too, because uh, uh, mountainous areas, I think, are uh, deficient in iodine, aren't they? Oh, and, interesting. And my wife talks about the Tipperary thyroid. Yeah. Um, whereas by the sea, if they're eating more seafood, that's less of a problem. Um, wasn't there, isn't that... Um, Cretinism is a dietary deficiency in iodine. Um, so that, yeah, it's certainly impact, the iodine deficiency has been impacted in human health for sure, has impacted human health. 
The other interesting um, epidemiologic things that have popped up with um, as far as looking at the odds ratio of cats developing hypothyroidism, the three times odds ratio if they use cat litter. Um, and canned food, gas heaters, and carpet cleaning with a lower odds ratio, but they're all things that have been linked to the development of hypothyroidism. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we know what thyroid hormones do to the heart. We've talked about that a little bit. What will they do to the blood pressure and blood volume? I'd expect them to increase blood pressure. Um, mm -hmm. Good. Um, I suppose volume would increase and that's how it would happen. Good. Excellent. Yep. So T3 increases RAS, which is going to do what? Retain sodium. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. So we increase blood volume. Why are they polyuric? Um, there's incre increased glomerular filtration pressure so they produce more urine but then they just drink more to compensate for it so their blood volume you sort of think any patient that's polyuric should be hypovolemic but these patients drink they compensate more than they more than they urinate does that make sense Mm. So they end up with a net increase in volume, which results in increase in pressure and also heart changes associated with that. What other changes do we see with hypertension? Oh, you might see ocular changes. Good. Yep. Retina. Retina, yep. And what about brain? Oh, strokes, I suppose, are more mm -hmm. in humans are certainly more likely. Good, yeah, exactly. They uh, tend to be cranky. I wonder whether that's to do with their brain or if they've got a headache or something, but they're cranky. Yeah, I haven't come across any comment on behaviour change as, like, what the cause is of that. But, yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, we'll call it hypertensive encephalopathy and give them a bit of a break. Anna? Yep. Yeah. Is when they often have like a murmur that then resolves, mm -hmm. is, is that more related to increased blood volume or um, the HCM changes? Good question. Do you mean that resolves with treatment of hypothyroidism? Yeah. yeah. Um, so most of the time, the murmur in hypothyroid cats is HCM related. Okay. So what it is, is thickening of the myocardium in the outflow tract. And the heart is trying to pump blood through a narrow opening. So it sounds like an aortic stenosis murmur. So that's the most common cause of murmur. But actually, now that you mention it, increased blood volume means there's increased stroke volume in the heart. So it's not only blood going through a narrow opening, it's more blood going through a narrow opening. So it's probably a combination of both of those things. All right. Um, how are we going to diagnose it? Uh, T4 is uh, the usual way. Yeah, exactly. T4 is a really good test. Quite variable over the course of the day. So if you've got a case that you're really convinced is hyperthyroid and your thyroid hormone level comes back normal, do it again. Try and do it at a different time of day maybe. Um, and then if it's still normal, do it again a month later. So it's probably just about to tip over the edge. Um, how are we going to treat it? Well, radioiodine or thyroidectomy, which is less popular. Yeah. Um, it's interesting the cultural or like, I guess, regional differences in kind of chosen th treatment strategies. Um, so a friend worked in England for seven years and he just took out all their thyroids and that was just what they did. So he's very competent at a thyroidectomy and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs>
um, uh, radioactive iodine is probably the most definitive treatment. Um, does anyone know how often cats will need a second treatment with radioactive iodine? It's not very often. Not very often. It's really good, actually. So 90% of cats are euthyroid after treatment. And only 2 to 5% will require a second treatment. What are the risks of radioactive iodine? Oh, hypothyroid isn't. Good. Yeah, exactly. And do you know what impact hypothyroidism has in cats? Like, is it a problem? Do we need to worry about it? You kind of lower the HDFR, and mm -hmm. um, so you might get some renal issues. Yes, exactly. So hypothyroidism, oh, sorry, hypothyroidism is a big problem for cats that have underlying renal disease because it will decrease renal perfusion and GFR. Um, and those cats that become hypothyroidism and azotemic, stage so three sort of azotemia after iodine treatment have a much poorer prognosis with their renal disease than cats that are euthyroid with the same level of azotemia. Um, so if I, if I treated a cat with iodine, detected hypothyroidism and they weren't azotemic, I wouldn't supplement them. But if I treated them with R131 and then checked their renal function and they had a stage three azotemia, I would certainly supplement thyroid hormone in those patients. Make sense? Mm. What about, we, we've mentioned surgery, we've mentioned I-131. What else do we use? Oh, there's the, um, uh, the tablets, the, um, mm -hmm. oh, the name won't come to me. Abimazole? Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so carbimazole or methimazole? Do you know how they're related? One's metabolized to the other. Yeah, exactly. So carbimazole is metabolized to methimazole. So, so every now and again, I hear somebody sort of say, oh, you know, methimazole is not associated, oh, carbimazole is not associated with bone marrow suppression side effects. And I would argue that it probably is. It's just that we don't have that data yet because carbimazole is methimazole essentially. Um, the nice thing about carbimazole is it comes in a sustained release tablet. So um, you can get once a day dosing in some patients. Um, uh, Bronze just mentioned you should use a lot of transdermal methimazole. And I actually think that's probably from a compliance perspective, that's probably the best option if you're going to be doing oral or if you're going to be doing daily medication. Um, I know how bad I am at remembering to give tablets. And my dog had an ear infection two weeks ago and he's had two doses of Dermotic so far. So I don't, <laughs> I'm going to start itching. I'm like, oh yeah. Um, so I re I'm, I'm very, very much admire clients. If they're doing medication, I try and keep it as manageable as possible. Um, so I think the transdermal is a great option. I think the I-131 is an even better option. If you had a patient that came in and you did your thyroid hormone testing and it's like 90, it's really high, and they had a creatinine of, let's say, 300, stage 3, iris stage 3 renal failure, what are you going to offer the client? What's your recommendation to the client? Well, you've got to be very careful. <clears throat> you probably mm. wouldn't do the radio iodine because... Mm. Uh, they, they, uh, they'll become, um, they go into renal failure because of the drop in blood pressure. They can do, yeah, exactly. Um, so Bronze just said oral treatment for six months. And what are you going to check? And maybe appetite, really? Appetite yeah. and azotemia impact. Yeah, so azotemia is a big one. So we want to check whether the cats become more clinical for their renal disease with a normal thyroid hormone level and what degree of azotemia increase they've had because these cats have increased blood volume when they're affected and then you drop their blood volume their creatinine is going to go up with no decrease in renal function does that make sense mm. so essentially you're giving them a relative pre-renal azotemia when you start methimazole or carbimazole treatment so creatinine is definitely going to go up so you can't rely just on the azotemia progressing to say whether they're candidates for I-131. You have to rely on hydration markers as well as the cat's clinical signs and demeanour 
and then there might be candidates for I one three one, um, but stage three, re stage three and four renal. I'm always a little bit. Ooh, maybe we should just continue with this medication. Um, uh, so, and also because the prognosis with stage four in particular is is less than a year, so putting them through a week of isolation is quite a big deal. Um, diet yeah. is also a treatment. The YD. Sorry, say that again. Diet is also a treatment. Diet, yes, good. And you talk those YD diet. Um, has anybody used that? Yeah, one. I think a nurse, <clears throat> a nurse that a practice I was at once had a uh, was using it, and effectively, from what I remember. Yeah, I have to. <clears throat> I think it's such a good option, particularly for these cats with um, azotemia. If if you can get them eating it, fantastic. Um, the trouble is that a lot of cats live in multi-cat households. So you're often suppressing thyroid function in, you know, for the other cats can get into this cat's food. And so I think it's harder in that, in that situation. But otherwise, I think it's a really good option if I131 and medication is not an option. All right. I think we got through most things that I wanted to cover. Does anybody have any questions? No, but that was brilliant. Thank you. You say that every week. <laughs> yeah, well, it's because it is brilliant every week. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice. Um, um, next week, I think it's... I'm going to be able to tell you. Next week, it's diabetes. Um, so quite, yes. So we're doing canine and feline diabetes in the same session. Any requests for specific focuses? Do we want to focus on treatment or do we want to focus on pathophysiology? I'd say both. <laughs> Can you talk a bit about like um, everyone's got a different opinion about monitoring? My, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so man let's say management. Yeah. And I think cats are a bit more controversial than dogs as far as management goes because you're going for a remission in cats. Um, so let's, let's focus on management. I will have a couple of sort of pathophys slides ready because a lot of the kind of fat metabolism and DKA discussion is good if we can look at it a picture. Uh, and just email me if you think of any requests that you would like to um, discuss. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Have a good day. See you, you too. Thank you. No worries. Bye. Bye. Oh.